absolutely delighted to have uh, Frederick here, the chef de cave or the cellar master for Runar. Um, and Runar's always had a really, really massive place in my heart. Um, used to be my house, uh, wine by the glass, my champagne by the glass in Boxwood. Back in the day when I used to work as a sommelier with Gordon Ramsay. Um, and it's kind of always been one of those champagnes, especially the Blanc de Blanc, which probably is my favorite, but it does change. Um, uh, you know, that has kind of traveled with me throughout my career. Um, so I'm super excited to have Frederick here. We were just talking, I was in Champagne literally this time last year, having the most wonderful lunch um, at Runar, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about Runar and food as, as we kind of go. But, you know, I think what we really, really want to do tonight is really get a real interesting look at how a Runar operates, what makes Runar Runar and just why it creates some of the best champagnes out there. So Frederick, thank you so much for joining us today. And I don't know if you just want to kick off with a little bit of kind of the history of Runar and what makes it it. Bonjour Dan, it's a real pleasure to uh, be live with you and, uh, and all uh, the Runar fans around, um, you know, we, we would love to travel. We would love to have you come back, but uh, we know the times are a bit rough. And, um, and also we're getting busy, we're getting ready for harvest. So we're getting really busy right now. Um, um, you know, this is, this is an, again a particular year, but the, what seems to be very particular uh, in the past few years seems to be the norm mm. or becoming the norm, which is also very scary. But uh, I guess we will talk about maybe um, sustainability and, and climate change and, and those topics cannot be ignored anymore. And we're having, you know, the proof currently at the moment with a, yet another harvest um, which is going to take place in August, probably the uh, earliest harvest on record ever, uh, even earlier than 2003. Which and uh, it's really? just, you know, as much as right now, maybe it's going to be uh, positive in terms of quality. If we project ourselves in 20 or 30 years, it's become really worrying. So, and definitely anyway definitely something that has to be talked about because i think there's you know in france you know not just in champagne I mean, oh, everywhere Pignac producer no. you know, burgundy you know everywhere is, is facing right, right it is a real concern but anyway um what makes Renard so special well i guess the answer is simple we're the first or we were the first officially established champagne house and that's quite a big thing you know but uh so why the first uh, some, sometimes people don't really understand or don't have all the knowledge about the history of Champagne. Let's start with, I think, the beginning. Uh, until 1728, Champagne as a sparkling wine was not legal. It was made. It was uh, probably going through the you know, tables and uh, escaping the tax system. But it was not officially uh, legal. And the king of uh, France at the time, Louis XV, is the one who authorized Bottling in Champagne. Now, we have to give you credit. Uh -huh, I was going to say. <laughs> for, for making glass strong enough to hold that pressure. And, and I guess it's been well documented that uh, sparkling wine was first discovered in England uh, because the bottles stood the pressure because you had another technique. You were using coal to make glass. And as a result, the glass was much, much thicker and much more robust, which we had in France. And so we had to wait for your technology to import it here and then master the art of uh, creating champagne. But why champagne? Because the region was cold, the wines would not ferment all the way through, leaves some residual sugar, which would, uh, with the temperature rising up in the following spring and the wines being bottled, create that foam, that mousse, which uh, people were particularly uh, keen on, on drinking, on tasting. So May 28th, we got the approval from the king, September 29, 1729 that is. Uh, Rina is officially uh, starting the first business of Champagne. Prior to that, the Rina family were uh, in the fabric business, which was the main business here in Champagne. But they, they quickly switched. Huh? The, the very first year, apparently they gave the bottles as token of appreciation for their best customers. Mm. But in six years, they switched completely from fabrics to Champagne, I, I tend to say that it's so much more fun to sell champagne than fabrics anyway. <laughs> uh, and and, uh, and by, so by 1735, we were, uh, we were fully uh, into uh, making champagne. Not only champagne, we, for a long time, 
the region and, and we as we now we were also crafting steel wines you know champagne was champagne as we know it was never guaranteed they could they didn't know how to master the uh, second fermentation the bottle could explode the bottle could not ferment you know so champagne with a good taste with uh, the foam clear white was an exceptional product and um, actually if you look at even at the late 1800s and even the early 1900s, the price of champagne was higher in restaurants than, let's say, Ikem, Latour, mm -hmm. uh, Margot, Cheval Blanc. I, you know, I, I wish it was still the case today because I can <laughs> afford those wines more. But, but you have to realize that people are, were ready to pay crazy prices for champagne. And it became a, 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 you know, sort of a symbol, more than a wine, like a symbol of celebration, of success, of joy, of, uh, of, of sh I think sharing as well. And I think, you know, that's something that's always sort of come through with the champagne. And, you know, I think it, it, it's something that the, the, the why champagne is so protected and something, you know, it's really important to say that champagne can only be made in champagne, you know, right. the, and the reason is, is because it's a protected region. It's, it's an AOP and right. actually champagne more than any other, um, probably for me, uh, protected uh, origin has really guarded it. Um, to, to the, the ninth degree and, and like even if anyone uses the word champagne on perfume or anything like that you know, the yeah, we were like well because the thing is you know you have to understand what happened with this if you let if you let the word champagne used here then how can you stop it here and here so if you let a beautiful perfume even if it's the best in the world using the name what's next soap yeah. <laughs> uh, toilet paper Which, you know once you've said yes you're Pretty much, it's too late. So, so we were very strict, but but I think, and and I know that there are some amazing sparkling wines being made in other parts of the world. I used to work in the in California. I've been making a few vintages in New Zealand. Uh, I'm following very closely what's happening in the UK, and some of the wines are excellent, you know. But I think the the trick is they have to find their identity. For me, if you try to copy somebody. It means you're inferior. It means you feel inferior. And this, this is the wrong mentality. You should be proud of your origin. You should be focusing on what makes you specific. Because otherwise, what's the point? You know? Like, I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't get it. And I don't think it's the future. So go, guys. Make, make a lot of excellent sparkling wine. And I think it will only help the, the sparkling wine business in the world. 100%. And I think, you know, it is, is that it's that idea of, you know, if I, I do a lot of blind, when I was doing my master of wine, I was doing a lot of blind tasting. And if I couldn't spot champagne, I didn't deserve to pass that NW because it is, it's key, it's fundamental, that elegance, that, that complexity and, you know, coming from why champagne's great, which is their wine use, the terroir of the right. ocean. Savoir you know, faire. Absolutely. You know, there's, so, there's so much that's part of, of, of that. And, you know, I think in the spirits world, we, we have a degree of absolutely, you know, when we talk a lot about spirits here because that's kind of our... our What's your name? Ah, we, ah yeah, we start. <laughs> oh, it's it's not champagne exchange. exchange. <laughs> I told Sakinda the other day it was going to be the wine exchange and I think you almost sacked me. I was like, but it should be. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's, it's not ever as strong as it is to a degree. I mean, there are areas... Right projective but the then the wine world and i think there's a lot to learn from the spirit world by what the wine world does and it is that sense of place and you're 100 you're right and and i think if you go to champagne which everyone should absolutely should um you really see it you see those beautiful rolling hills the white soils the different areas you know right. you get it you know and, and it's hugely important and you know so you, just just to go back on history um what, how did we start? Um, we, we like to think that the monk, Don Thierry Ruinard, you know, there are a few famous monks in Champagne, the most famous being Don Perignon, of course, who was actually, you know what? Don, people don't usually know that, but Don, D-O-M, Don, uh, is a shortening for Dominus. And Dominus, if you've studied Latin, which you probably didn't, but maybe a few of them guys did, Dominus in Latin means master. So to become a Dominus, you have to be a monk, who masters something. And mm -hmm. Don, Don, Don Perignon was a master in wine, a master in viticulture. He was mastering the art of making wine, not sparkling wine yet. Or Don, Don Thierry Ruina, was a master in letters, literature, theology, uh, philosophy. And as such, he traveled uh, 
Europe, France and Europe, and was well introduced, well connected to the uh, King of France and the friends of the King of France. And this is where he saw that even though it was not legal yet, but the rich and famous had an interest in, the, in this magic sparkling wine because it was new, there was this form, it was fantastic, it was tasting amazing. And so he told his family, his nephew, that maybe a champagne business would be a smart thing to do. And so uh, after he died, his nephew started the business in 1729. He started, as I said, modestly, but we were pioneering in many ways. We, we came here where we are now. I'm, I could maybe uh, uh, use my computer and show you where we are later on. Uh, I'm standing right above the Crayère, and, and the Crayère is where we're one of the five houses uh, that has uh, amazing deep chalk cellars which were primarily not used to be sellers at all. They were uh, used to extract the chalk to uh, be, you know, different uses, but mostly mortar or in construction. Uh, but they were totally abandoned for many centuries. And then they were rediscovered. And, and when you make champagne, you need space. Storage, you age the wine for many years. You know, it's, it's it, it quickly becomes like unbearable if you don't have a huge cellar. And, and, don't, and uh, Nic uh, Nicolas Ruinard found out that this, this pot would be amazing to store champagne. But of course, there was a lot of work, but he bought the first property here, which at the time was outside of the main city, just on the verge of the city, but not within the, the boundaries of the city. And uh, that's where he you know, renovated and, and, and managed uh, to turn them into cellars. So we are very fortunate because uh, we have those magnificent two layers of cellars, which is quite rare. We have the deepest cellar, nearly 40 meters deep, uh, something which becomes, I mean, which seems obvious, but they are naturally temperature controlled. We don't, we don't use air conditioning here. Actually, we don't even have air conditioning in offices, which is very difficult now. <laughs> For the wine, temperature is very stable at 12 degrees, uh, summer, winter, makes no difference. And so I, we have this not only beautiful, but like perfect storage conditions to, uh, for champagne. And I, that's so important because I think the one thing a lot of people, when they think of, you know, the cost of champagne, don't realize that, I mean, minimum, minimum for non-vintage, and actually probably we should have a little glass or something because I'm getting thirsty, um, you know, minimum aging requirements for champagne, and it's even more so for, for yourselves as a Grand Marc, you know, you're, for a non-vintage. It's 15 months, yeah. 15 months, yeah. But for vintage, three years, but we go way beyond that for the vintages especially. So, and you, you, that's, that's a lot of time to store a lot of bottles, you know? Yeah, it takes space. It adds up. I mean, this, this, I, this morning I was talking with uh, the production manager and he, he told me, uh, Fred, if we are making Don Rinard 2020, where are we going to store it? It's like, yeah, we need to, you know, sales have been a bit slow. So we had more stock of Don Rinard. And then we've done 17, 18, 19. So four in a row would be uh, unheard of. And, and that takes a lot of space because you, you, you store them for... 10, 11, 12 years. So um, yeah, storage, storage is an issue here. And, and actually, if we're going to maybe taste the first wine, I, mean, I think we'll start with the Runa non vintage. I'm ready. Uh, you're having half bottles, right? Yes. OK, I'm having half Magnum. <laughs> I love it. I think I prefer your half Magnum to my half bottle. <laughs> um, but maybe it's a nice idea maybe to start and just kind of go through non vintage, vintage even though we sort of haven't got a vintage taste, but just the understanding of, actually, in a funny way, a vintage is more driven by a decision on how good the year is, whereas non-vintage, you have to keep amazing consistency. Exactly. You amazing. have to, where non-vintage, it's a no-brainer. You have to make it every year, whether it's an amazing year or a, a challenging year, as we say in a winemaking language, <laughs> which would be lousy or I won't use any other bad word. I know enough of them. <laughs> That's okay. I swear all the time on these things. I get so much trouble, it's untrue. <laughs> but um, no, it'd be really good to maybe just talk about why non-vintage is actually more challenging. I mean, you, you can tell me I'm wrong, but you know, for me, you know, non-vintage is more challenging to produce. Just, just because of that, just because of that reason, we are, even though we are right now in a more favorable uh, weather pattern, you know, the, the climate change, the global warming is doing good because it, we, it's, it means we have great ripening conditions every year, maybe too good in a way, and that's another thing. But, but we, we haven't had any really bad year. 17 was challenging because of botrytis, but unripe year, I think the last one was 2001. And honestly, yeah. I think there will be fewer and fewer. Um, 
So, so maybe there's less of a challenge than before where those years were like trouble in terms of quantity and quality. Uh, yet we need to uh, be as consistent as possible, um, even though we're not perfectly consistent. Mm -hmm. Especially, I was, this is something I realized at Prina. Uh, we are, I think our expression of wine is quite modern. You know, you, we, I'm gonna get back to that in, in a moment. And in a world that changes, if you wanna stay modern, you have to change. If you stay quiet, if you stay the same, in a few years, you're like, you're lost. You're, you're already behind. So if you wanna keep modernity in your style, you have to introduce new techniques, new technology, new savoir-faire, and slightly, and this will slightly change the style year after year. You can't see it, it's like a, if you take a selfie of you every year, every day, you don't see it if you look at them, you know, slowly, but if you like span them over like two years, then you see yourself change. Well, I think it's the same thing with champagne, with our champagne, with our non-vintage. So what's our style? At, at Rina for the non-vintage, the whole idea is to, um, be as close to the fruit as possible. And that's very important to understand. Uh, mm. Typically in Champagne, uh, there are different styles. And, and, and you know, it, there is like a old taste for everybody. Uh, what we've decided to do a long time ago is two things. First, uh, rely a lot on the Chardonnay grapes because Chardonnay tends to bring more lightness, more elegance, more freshness because it's the only main white variety. And as such, compared to the Pinot Noir and Meunier, which usually are a bit more full-bodied, especially the Pinot Noir, uh, Chardonnay-based champagnes are typically more elegant and fresher. So that's the first thing uh, initiated after World War II. But on top of that, in terms of all winemaking technique, we want to um, really respect the fruit, but I, I don't want to bullshit, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I want, we want to keep the, the, the um, flavors from the grape. So in all wine making, we are not looking to get like yeasty, uh, buttery, oak, anything like this. We, we have a very neutral approach in our wine making. And as such, one of the way to be neutral and to keep the freshness of the grapes is to uh, understand that your enemy in wine making, my enemy in such wine making is oxygen. Oxygen, you need it. We all need it, otherwise we don't live. But too much oxygen is actually also uh, aggressive and it can make things age quickly. And it can be, an, it can be great, you know, if you, if you like oxidative wines, such as sherry or vin jaune or other stuff, they, bring, they, have, they have like an identity. But they tend to um, not keep the freshness of the fruit. It's another expression of the fruit, more oxidized, more uh, bruised, and we don't want that. that so, so the, the really the, one of the focus at Rina is to during all the process make sure that there is as little oxygen as possible that gets into the into the wine. And I think it's something we talked about and what I wanted to touch on again. And, and I didn't realize you were doing this until last year. And um, what the project's been doing is is very much actually looking at the whole process, and not just looking at bringing the wines in from the cellar. Oh, the it's every it's from once you pick the grapes to disgorging, to the, even using the, to the kind of corks you use, every matters, everything matters. There's, there's, when people ask me, what's your secret? I say, there's no one secret. In, in this philosophy, it's like uh, every small creek makes the river at the end. And, and if, you, if you cut one creek, the river won't flow as, as well. So you have to make sure that you, you manage every detail with precision. And I think one of the big changes you did, well, two big changes, and I, you'll have to remind me what year it was, I think it was 2017, but I could be wrong, is, is the, the way, one, you were aging the, the bottles, um, either not so that's, caps anymore, but also... Right. That's, that's, for, uh, that's for Don Renard, and that's since 2010, uh, but I can go back to that later, maybe when we talk about Blonde Blanc and we talk about Don Renard. We'll show you a slide that, if you, for, the geeks, for the geeks among you guys, you will love it. <laughs> but, 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 but I mean, being being very cautious with oxygen. Again, it's not. I don't. I don't say it's better. It's like it's our style, and we have our, our friends that I have friends at Bollinger that makes exceptional champagne, um, where they are a bit more permissive with oxygen. Not so much, but more, and and it gives a completely different style, and that's totally respectable. But but we've decided to uh, have the expression of the fruit in in the non-vintage uh, Air de Renard. 
you actually have a blend of Pinot Noir, 45, 50%. Chardonnay is typically around 40%. And so Meunier makes the rest, let's say 10 to 15%, um, depending on the vintage. And, and, and uh, you don't, you know, I think the expression is more towards like uh, orchard fruits, yeah. uh, stone fruits, um, maybe a little bit of that gentle biscuit fresh dough, which comes with the uh, aging on the leaves. Aging on the leaves for uh, Renard Non Vintage is not so long. We, we're talking about two, a bit over two years, 26, 28 months is, is my ideal time. So it's enough to get a bit of that yeasty flavor, but not so much of it. What's interesting is actually, I haven't had Runar non-vintage for a while, because as I said, I, I'm a big fan of Blanc de Blanc, so normally that's kind of my go-to. And actually, I think there's a brightness to it, and there's a juiciness to it that I don't, there's some sort of yellow plums, there's this really lovely sort of almost a floral character, which I don't remember before. And I think it's really interesting when you said about the, so the selfies, how right. You know, you, if you taste it every day, you don't see it. But We've changed. We've changed. Going back, I, you know, it really has changed. And oh. you know, it's a I'm very, very familiar with, but I haven't had for a while. And actually, I love yeah. it. I and you, just... you men you're mentioning the juiciness, which, which I translate also in terms of like a, a certain softness or rumness. And this is also another element of the Rina winemaking. We, we work a lot about the, on the texture. So that's how do we work on it? Well, first, let me, let me um, tell you my, um, really my um, deep conviction or, uh, uh, about uh, the texture. I think, you know, sometimes, quite often, people tell us why wow, your winner, the, the bubbles are so delicate and so small. Small, nothing to do with it. Small, uh, the size of the bubbles is mostly influenced by the glass. It changes in the glass, it gets bigger, so the size means nothing. If, if you want to know more about it, I can even give you at the end some link to uh, some amazing uh, uh, TED uh, videos about the uh, scientific aspect of bubbles. On bubbles as well. It's French though. <laughs> but, but anyway, so the way to play with bubbles is to play with the texture. Like you need to wrap those bubbles. Like you need to package them. And, and from my experience, you need to start with the blend before it gets sparkling, the, the cuvee, the blend, with something that has like layers, that is thick, you know? It's, it needs to be more, let's say, cashmere than, than silk. They, they, there oh needs to be some like um, texture to it at the beginning. And, and if you have that kind of slightly oily, well, I'm not talking Mursault, huh? but slightly oily or consistency, then the bubbles will be fully integrated, even if the wine is fairly young. On vintage, it's a different story. The time will help it. But on, on younger non-vintage, you, you have to start with that texture that will allow to have that kind of very fine, delicate, silky um, impression of the bubbles. And this will all allow you something else. This will allow you to be fairly low on dosage. Mm. And we've dropped, when I came, dosage was 12 to 13 grams. When I came on board in 2007, mm. this is now seven grams per liter. I was gonna ask actually about the dosage and had it come down because you know, you do sense that as well. And when you're tasting it, and I think also is that, well, two questions actually on my side. Texture, are you getting that texture from a little bit of the reserve one, giving it a bit of weight? Are you getting right. it from the vineyards you're picking because actually you know it's 100 percent right i always talk about when i talk about champagne and bubbles i talk about the 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 aggressiveness the texture because some champagnes have a very aggressive bubble and you it almost feels like it's attacking your mouth whereas actually this one's kind of tiptoeing down your palate and just bringing flavor with it and i think that's quite interesting so it is it's coming from a little bit of kind of the reserve wine the, the choice reserve wines are Reserve wines are very critical for that. And, and we, we don't use a lot. Well, 25 to 30% is, is our typical norm of reserve wines. They're usually quite young. We don't want them to bring mature flavors. We want to keep the freshness. So we typically, what you have in your, in your half bottle, as I have in my bottle, should be based on the 17 mm -hmm. harvest. Um, so it would be 17, 16, and 15. So three okay. years together. We don't go crazy back 
uh, vintages like some other people do because it, it doesn't make sense if you want to keep the fruitiness. Mm -hmm. Then the terroir, uh, where we select the grapes, is also clearly important. So there's a good base of Premier Cru and Grand Cru, but they wouldn't be enough. Those wines need more time to show their softness. So you need to also work with other vineyards that tend to age faster, that tend to have naturally more roundness. And this is where uh, knowing where to buy and, and who to partner with in terms of like grape supply is very important as well. And, and, and the winemaking, last point, I think our, our gently reductive winemaking, in my opinion, it, it also helps to have less aggressivity at the mm -hmm. end. And you, are you putting through malolactic fermentation as well? That's another good element. All of our wines go through full malolactic. Uh, I guess you know that it's the transformation of, I mean, Dan, I have no issue with you, but for all our friends around, it's a transformation of uh, an acid which is a bit stronger, which is called malic acid from the apple, mal, uh, malus, and to lactic acid. Lact lactis is milk, so it's a softer kind of acid. But sometimes, and often, when you do that fermentation, uh, you also, par in parallel, have an increase in those, in those uh, buttery, caramelly uh, uh, flavors, and we don't want them because we think they interfere with the fruit. Not that we don't, but it's, it's not that they're bad, and some people love them. You know, some people are really looking. I, I used to live in America making wine, and at the time it was crazy, like the big, mallow, but they, 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 they're coming back from that. I think there was an extreme, and now they're changing. But still, in Champagne, it's, it's quite easy to have them, and we found ways to mitigate, mm -hmm. to prevent from them from happening. That's a little bit of a savoir-faire, using uh, some technology, not very difficult, but there's a lot of control, temperature control, timing, co-inoculation, you know, what kind of bacteria, what kind of yeast together work well. And we've pretty much eliminated this uh, flavor. And and I think, you know, like, it's, it's really interesting because mallow does give this beautiful roundness to the palate. And, you know, I think that's one of the kind of the things that's really important about mallow lactic is that it's roundness and fresh and still. Yeah, and I think, I think it's even more obvious in the, in the Blanc de Blanc, so maybe we should switch yeah. to the Blanc de Blanc. I'm not going to complain about that. So in I terms know it's one of your favorite. I know. Bringing down dosage um, levels. So the dosage, again, for those of you who don't know, um, at the end of the production, when you right. go to the forge, um, sometimes you just add a little what we call dosage, which is just a top up. It's the some champagne with some sugar, um, added to it, just uh, grape sugars um, or natural sugars just to adjust because originally it was done to because it was so cold in champagne that sometimes the, the grapes maybe were a little acidic yeah this and also for the loss during this disgorgement there used to be major losses and they had to top it up so topping with uh, something sweet and also remember back in the old days if you had sugar you had you had money you had wealth yeah you know, like sugar, refined sugar was something very expensive. Now it seems crazy, but in, that was how, spices and sugar were like super uh, rare items. And so something sweet was more expensive. And which is very interesting for those of you who, um, who kind of are rum people, because you know, that's how the whole rum industry started going. And I know I, I'm always trying to bring it back to spirits, just that I want more spirit people drinking great champagne. So I'm trying to kind of give context a little bit, but. You know, bringing down that dosage level, was that because you were getting regular grapes coming through? You just felt actually there was a change in what people wanted? Because I think a lot of people are looking maybe But it's, 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 there's a little bit of everything. Like I think the, the taste of sommelier first and then the consumers and then the climate change. Um, but people think climate change, warmer climate, more sunshine, higher temperatures, less acidity because temperature has a direct influence on acidity less dosage but it's it's way more complex than that yeah. part of it is explained by this but part of it is also explained by the difference in the grape balance induced by the environmental uh, consciousness of champagne that started uh, 20 years ago i think we were one of the first region to really work on how to drop our uh, green gas emissions and uh, and being more uh, environmentally friendly and so one of the big things was stopping herbicides. We've been stopping herbicides uh, quite a few years ago now. We've been, so cover cropping, and there's no easy solution. Huh? So we need to cover crop. And by cover cropping, you introduce, so cover crop means you 
uh, put uh, grass between the rows, and that's usually quite good, um, except it competes with the vineyards and it tends to lower the yields. And, and if you lower the yield, you have more concentration. Not always, not always the best thing in Champagne. Champagne needs to be quite delicate. And if the wines are too, if the grapes are too concentrated, they may be great for still wines, but not so much for sparkling wines. Mm -hmm. the, the best years, the best vintages in Champagnes are usually quite big. Like they're quite plentiful, uh, super small yields, do not always, or in Champagne, certainly not, give the best results. As, and that's different from still wine, very, very different. But anyway, so the composition, the balance of the grapes has changed because of, of our approach to um, environmental to, uh, uh, issues and the weather together and the taste. So it's, it's this combination of things that have probably um, made us drop the dosage typically. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is interesting because I'm seeing a lot of houses doing the same thing and, and you know, I, it's great because you, you get more of the kind of character. Well, Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay, so that's a big difference compared to the uh, Air de Renard. And I think what, what I said before about the, our approach in fruit, here with the Chardonnay, it's so easy to, uh, to see. I think the result is a very zesty, very lifted, you have a lot of like citrus, yuzu, grapefruit, uh, all kinds of citrus fruits, white floral notes, and then some uh, what I call the green spices, like ginger, maybe a drop of like uh, pink peppercorn, uh, cardamom. So it's very lifted. And that's really how we want this Chardonnay to be in terms of menu. Yet on the palate, it's quite silky and smooth for a Chardonnay, for a Blanc de Blanc in Champagne, which tends to be more austere in a good way. Huh? But yeah. most of the Blanc de Blanc uh, from the Côte des Blancs, let's say. They're quite uh, lean, mm -hmm. uh, but this is not our vision of Chardonnay, of Blanc de Blanc. We want a Blanc de Blanc that is as easy to drink as, uh, you know, as the air non-vintage. And I mean, it's, it's, such a, it's such a great champagne, and I agree with you. It's just got those lovely citrus fruits. I get that sort of little mandarin. Actually, there's a little peachy note to this. Which yeah, I yeah, yeah, white, typically, yeah. Yeah, nectarine, peach, totally. Wait. And almost chamomile, you know, like uh, yet flowers or just we have like a uh, magnolia. You know, magnolia. It's a very citrusy flower. <laughs> but yeah, chamomile, linden tree. So pretty, so pretty. But I, I, I tell you what. I have a. I, I joined the company in two thousand and seven, and the man who took over the company in nineteen forty six after World War Two had still an office here. He was 80, 85 or 86 years old. He would still come on a regular basis to Arena to his ex office, sometimes acting like he was still owning the company. It was no longer the case, but, but he was an amazing man uh, to talk to, you know, and, and I love talking to the, the people who have that experience and knowledge. And he's the one who uh, really started to focus on Chardonnay. Uh, launching uh, Don Renard in 59, launching the vintage 47 Blanc de Blanc, uh, Renard. And I asked him one day, so Mr. Muir, why, why did you pick up Chardonnay at a, at a time where Chardonnay was not as uh, popular as today? Today, everybody is going for Blanc de Blanc. Everybody is looking for Chardonnay. It's a war on grapes to get the good Chardonnay. It's really uh, very interesting, uh, but very challenging at the same time. But that, back in the days, champagnes were more robust, more, they were bigger, they were fuller, you know, that's, that was the style. And he told me this answer that I, that I never, um, I will never forget, he told me, Fred, Frédéric, I love my champagne from 9 a.m. in the morning until 9 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> A man after my own heart. <laughs> and I think it's the, the best answer ever to understand why the Renard style. So, but he understood. I mean, this guy was a genius. He was 26 years old, 27 years old at the time. And he understood very early on that, um, you know, something friendly to drink, something appealing, something that has that nice texture, lightness would work so well. And, uh, and that's, I'm very loyal to his uh, motto. I, and I, I, and I, I, I've actually, I did a Zoom meeting like right now with Japan about a month ago. I, I was drinking this at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. Perfect. So 9 a.m. to 9 a.m., no problem, my friend. <laughs> well, 
Breakfast, I always say great champagne, no problems. You can drink it anytime, anytime, any place, anywhere. Great champagne. <laughs> we like to say, may all your pain be champagne. That's yeah, one of us. Definitely. I'm going to get a t shirt. <laughs> right. So, so Blanc de Blanc, for, for, the, for the Blanc de Blanc, we source grapes from about 20 to 25 different crus. Uh, there is some Grand Cru, huh? typically, uh, there would be some Chouilly, some uh, Avis, uh, but typically the one that tends to mature more, like our tank that tends to be more maturing quickly. Mm -hmm. We would put them in a non vintage. Then a lot of premier cru. Think about Tessie, Villers Marmerie, Vertu. So around the Côte des Blancs, the Montagne de Reims. But we also use a significant amount of uh, non premier cru, non grand cru grapes. Uh, think about the area such as Cézanne mm -hmm. and Vitria. Those areas, they're on pure chalk. Chardonnay thrives on chalk. Slopes facing east or southeast. Not so much the south. Not so much the uh, heavy soils of clay, it, it really likes the chalk. But on those specific areas, uh, it tends to uh, mature quite quickly and make wine that are, that are aging quite fast. So for non-vintage, it's perfect. So, so we rely more and more on, on these areas. Uh, I mean, the, like the Grand Cru, Premier Cru give us the, the quality base, but we also use some of those uh, non-Premier Cru to bring more roundness, bring more softness, because this is the Chardonnay, that, the Blanc de Blanc that we like, uh, that we like at Winner. And, and I think a lot of people have in their heads that Grand Cru, Premier Cru is necessarily the best, but actually there's some amazing... It not depends what you want to do. It really yeah. depends on the style you want to achieve. And they're not always the best for that, for instance. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's such a key, is that that's part of that sort of non-vintage, sort of, you have to have those non-Premier and Grand Cru. Yeah. Uh, premier Cru and Grand Cru, it's only one third of Champagne anyway. Oh. I always, I, mean, I remember Remy Cru always used to say to me, it's not about the Premier and Grand Cru, it's about the region and the best sites. It doesn't matter what they are, you just use what you need to make something beautiful. Uh, having said that, when it comes to uh, vintage Champagne that you want to keep for a long time, let's say 10 years or more, then Grand Cru, Premier Cru, they tend to make the difference. And actually a question that's often asked, and I think it's quite, maybe quite a nice one to bring in now. I mean, how long would you keep these champagnes for? So the non-vintage, the vintage, and well, versus say Dom Runar or vintage. Okay, so, so as, as, as we saw, our non-vintage are more based on the fruit. They're more spontaneous. The aromas are very fresh. So they are, they are really not meant to be kept a long time. Uh, for me, the ideal uh, drinking window would be two, three years after purchase. And half bottles, probably even a year. Magnums, maybe up to five years. After that, they will not turn bad. They will change. Mm -hmm. They will be a bit more uh, toasty. They will lose their, their nice fruitiness. They will turn into something a bit more, uh, with a bit more um, mature flavors of fruit. It could be your thing. Uh, but that's not the style that I want to express, that my team wants to express. So I've had Blanc de Blanc that was seven years old, that was actually very enjoyable. But it will never be like Don Renard, because when we build them, we build them differently. When we build Don Renard, Don Renard at that stage, three years old, is bloody awful. <laughs> it's, it's completely closed. It's like, that's doesn't speak. Right. It's mute. It's acidic. It's rigid. It's like no charm at all. It needs 10 years. And so, you know, we don't, we don't exactly, we don't elaborate, we don't craft them the same way. We don't use the same grapes, the same wines to build them. So non-vintage, yeah, for me, two, three years, you can keep them longer, it's not what I recommend. Mm -hmm. Don Renard, poof, as long as you want. I've, I've had uh, 1969, 1973, drinking amazingly well. Oh, you have a, have, we have different corks. Okay. Mine is, I can't, no, this is. But I'm that's only, better. Oh. That's better, maybe. Oh. I, on, I only use, so what you have on half bottles, and let's talk technique, are. Uh, ah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, you can see quite clearly the difference. Okay, this is, my cork is a, a regular cork. Yeah. Made from a two discs of plain cork and then the, the head, which is agglomerated. This? Uh, the Mythic is made from a, what, what you have on half bottles. If I highlight myself, I don't know if I talk, you can see it. No, I think we can see it very well. 
Uh, so those corks are, it's also cork, but it's kind of a deconstructed, cleaned with a high pressure carbonic uh, dioxide liquid form and reconstructed. Yeah. And what it does, it cleans all the um, TCA, so the, the, the musty flavors, and uh, it gives more regularity. And it is also more reductive. So we call these mini barrels because right. they are, there is an ingress of oxygen no matter what you do. These are mini barrels, so they affect flavor in the same way, but just as a slower. But, but they, they, the ingress of oxygen, they release less oxygen. Mm -hmm. and, and for the half bottles particularly, it is very important. For the bottles, my experience is they close the wine too much. So I'm mm -hmm. not ready yet to use them on full bottles. As okay. soon as I have uh, the same kind of cork that respect the wine the way I want it, like that in terms of uh, oxygen barrier, then I'd be happy to use them because they are more efficient. So can we talk about oxygen now? Can we talk about oxygen? <laughs> Let me talk about oxygen. <laughs> Bridget's like, she's obsessed with oxygen. <laughs> Well, I can, I can share one screen about oxygen is, it's, it's not so true for a non-vintage because they don't stay in the, in the bottle long enough mm -hmm. um, to do what we are going to do with Don Renard. But let me, let me share with you something about oxygen and, and champagne. So um, let's see here. Uh, during aging, the bottle position can be quite important. So typically the champagne bottle ages in a, horizontal position, you can see here. And when the bottle is horizontal, the, the deposit of dead yeast is lying on the, obviously the lower part of the bottle, you can see in here. Mm -hmm. uh, once you riddle the bottle and you put it uh, vertically, the deposit of yeast has been gathered, as you can see here, uh, has been gathered around the neck and it makes a big difference. Maybe you don't, you don't realize it, but it does make a big difference. So let me be a bit more uh, specific here. Uh, oxygen, believe it or not, but despite the pressure in the bottle, and the pressure in the bottle is uh, because of carbonic gas, not oxygen. Oxygen in the bottle at that stage is zero. It is always zero because it is consumed and transformed by a chemical reaction with components of the wine, typically giving oxidized flavors, slowly but surely. So when the bottle is lying down, oxygen seeps through that um, area here. So basically, even if you thought it would be the perfect uh, seal, it's not a perfect seal. There is a bit of oxygen getting in and actually a bit of carbonic gas, I don't show it here, but a bit of carbonic gas getting out. So oxygen gets in contact with the wine. Mm -hmm. When the bottle is upside down, oxygen gets in contact with the dead yeast sediment. And, and even when the yeast are dead, they still manage to absorb oxygen. So that, that sediment of dead yeast is acting like a buffer. And as a result, the wine here in that position ages very, very, very much slower than compared to horizontal. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly enough, I'm gonna stop here. Interestingly enough, uh, this is something that uh, was the norm back in the days. In the, like the, our ancestors in the uh, early 1900s, late 1800s, they would store the bottle upside down to keep them. And they, but they didn't know why, because they had the time to observe. They were paying attention, something we don't do maybe less, but now we know technically why this happens. So for our uh, library program, part of my job is to make the wine for now, mm -hmm. but most important part of my job is to leave a legacy. When I'm dead, the later the better. <laughs> uh, people will st hopefully still enjoy that wine that we made, you know, and I'm talking uh, 50, 100 years from now. And that's what we need to, we need to leave. And that's what one of the most interesting part of my job is we can leave a legacy. And not everybody can say that, uh, but we leave a legacy for the house and for the future generations. And so we are 
building that library with wine that hopefully we'll be able to, you know, uh, still good, still be tasting good in a 50, 60, 70, even 100 years from now. And I think, you know, that's so amazing. And, and actually why I, whenever I talk about sort of champagne, I always think it's probably the closest thing to spirits in terms of, you know, you can, I mean, I've had some amazing bottles that have been sort of 50, 60 years old that are just still absolutely stunning. And I've had, I've had, uh, in a few, few years ago, I've had uh, 1914 Bollinger, at yeah. Bollinger, amazing, made during the war. It was, you know, you drink history, and it's so emotional, but that's, give me the idea. Let's see, in, in nine years from now, we now will turn 300 years old. Wow. The first company, of course, in Champagne, because we were the first to turn 300. So going into our fourth uh, century. <laughs> and uh, when I joined Renard, uh, I quickly I, I got in touch with a, a friend in Alsace. Well, she became a friend, but who told me that one of her friends had a 1929 Renard vintage in, her, in his cellar from his grandparents. So I went there and there were 20 bottles of it. And uh, about 10 of them were in pristine condition. They never moved the cellar. They were purchased in the mid thirties, uh, never had left the cellars and we, we made a deal. They are now here in uh, one of the secret place and the idea is to open them Amazing. in 2029. So we will be drinking 100 year old champagne, which was made for the bicentenary of the house, celebrating the tree centenary of the house. How cool is that? That is amazing. Amazing. And I think that's what, that's what it is. And I mean, I talk to people about it, you know, drinking history is just so exciting. You know, it is, it's, it's a part of something that you were never part of. And, you know, it's kind of, being able to understand the quality. And I think that's what's so exciting, whether you're drinking spirit or wine or champagne, you know, it's, it's that sense of sort of where it came from and, and the quality and the reason why it's so protected and the reason why it's so amazing is that quality. I, I, I didn't have the question about Blanc de Blanc, but I'm, this clear bottle is amazing, it's beautiful, but as, a, as the winemaker in charge of the quality, it's a nightmare. 100%. Because it can be affected by light strike. Light will affect it and change the quality and actually destroy the quality of this wine. So as a, a way to protect the wine, but initially the idea was to be more uh, environment friendly. We, are, we just introduced, and I think it will be available in your country in the coming months, uh, this new packaging, which will, it's called the second skin, it is like a second skin. It is a super light, paper thin. It's actually made of paper. Okay. Recycled paper. Uh, um, it's actually uh, super light, like nine times lighter than a gift box, and it will replace all Renard gift boxes. Brilliant. So, decrease in green gas emissions, 60% compared Amazing. to uh, our previous gift box, which was already probably the friendless gift box in the industry. Amazing. No, I mean, uh, even better, it is made in the UK by, uh, <laughs> by a company which uh, uh, is high up in, the, uh, in Northern England, uh, in a, in a um, UNESCO, I... World Heritage Area, super friendly, uh, eco, you know, like eco friendly uh, um, production. Like water is recycled, they use uh, eco managed forest only. Uh, and this, is, this has been uh, a very good answer, I think, to, uh, to the problem of, uh, of packaging. Um, you know, people focus a lot now when you talk about um, uh, environmental issues, people focus on the vineyards, but you have to realize that both vineyards and enology winemaking combined only represent 10 to 13% of the uh, green gas emissions. Mm. Packaging is thirty six percent, and I think the interesting thing is, is champagne is so packaging heavy because it's such a gifting. Yeah, and, and this is what we want to, you know, change. We want to. I think this is a game changer. Absolutely, and, uh, and we want to change the rule because honestly, sometimes. But even in your, even in the whiskey industry, like oh. the, the heavier, the better. I guess it's time to change. So, so this has been a very bold move. 
because uh, you know getting rid of gift boxes doesn't come so easy because people associate steel campaign and gifting. But we think that in in a matter of few years, gift box will be completely has been. And I, I hope that is true. And, and I think one other thing that the Champagne region has done is they've made the, the bottles lighter as well, which was a, a big thing. That was, a couple, that was five years, six years ago now, I think. Yeah? We've, we've uh, well, the, the standard Champagne bottle is 20% uh, lighter than, uh, than previously. And we're still, Champagne is still working on it. Uh, our bottle is not. And this is one thing we're working on. Brilliant. But it's, it's very, very difficult. We're, we're challenging uh, the glass makers, but what we are doing right now is helping the glassmaker or working with glassmakers that are themselves turning into more uh, uh, sustainable energy. Because the biggest problem in glassmaking is not so much the weight, that's for transportation, but in the glassmaking, it's the, the quantity of energy they use to create a glass. And the amount of water as well, isn't it? Water is... Uh, water, not so much, more energy. I thought water was a big thing in glassmaking. But, you know, I think... I think Rosé. I mean, it's never, never a bad time to have rosé. And right. I think the interesting thing about rosé is that I remember when I started in the industry, it was sort of just on the cusp of when sort of people, because rosé was always the sort of the cheaper option. And, and then the city boys discovered, well, in the UK, the city boys discovered Laurent Perrier rosé and suddenly rosé became this huge I thing. And you know, I've seen rosés sort of change from being kind of cheaper than some non-vintage in some cases to now being sort of premium and and yours, you know, uh, I think the Renard Rosé is probably, would you say, the least known of the, of the three? Or? It depends where, maybe in the UK, but in some countries it's not the case. But, you know, I mean, you got to credit uh, Laurent Perrier Rosé for... Uh, doing a great job and then being uh, quite early on with uh, promoting Rosé, I think in the late 60s. Yeah. But did you know that the first producer of, of Rosé was Rina? We, yes, we, found out, we found out <laughs> four years ago, five years ago, that uh, as early as 1764, so 256 years ago, we produced uh, a wine called Oeil de Perdri, Partridge Eye in English, probably by mistake, but uh, remarkably uh, and, and smartly enough, they, they marketed it as something like uh, different and more exclusive. And uh, it gained popularity quite quickly. It, it was never big, but it was in demand. And, and the name Rose came in the early, late 17, like 1794 or 96. And after that, but for a long time it was known as Eau Paris. So we we were also the first to craft rose champagne. Even if you don't mean to, I like it. <laughs> the best things happen by mistake. <laughs> exactly. We think it was a mistake. Probably uh, the press. My idea is the press. The press machine broke down. The grapes macerated, and at the time uh, Chardonnay. I mean, what first Chardonnay was not even men uh, mentioned yet, but there were probably more black grapes, and so the juice came pinkish, and they had to make something out of it. So how do we make rosé? Champagne is the unique region in, in Europe where you can uh, have two techniques. You can macerate black grapes. But typically, if you macerate, sometimes it's called saigné. Mm. But I'm not going to go into details of that. But if you make this kind of a, a maceration, you need to use black grapes only, or the vast majority of black grapes. And, and as a result, the, the wines are more uh, whiny. The champagnes are more a bit more structured, a bit more whiny because they are based off Pinot Noir and, and or Meunier. For us, Chardonnay drives the style. So we've always used a high proportion of Chardonnay. This is 45% Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And so we need to use a different technique. We make red wine from Pinot Noir grapes. And when we blend Pinot Noir red with Chardonnay white and Pinot Noir made as white, like for the other champagne. So, so this is a, a blending exercise where you combine the color and the flavor to reach the desired level of intensity. And, and what percentage of red still wine are you adding in roughly? Well, climate change influence again. When I joined, 20%. 20 years, 22 years ago, 23 years ago, routinely 20%. Last year, 10%. Wow. The grapes are changing. 
they are more the 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 the, the level of uh, phenolic compounds which is usually linked to maturity uh is getting higher the grapes are getting more ripe and as a result there is more uh coloring compounds we also know better how to manage the vineyards how to extract those compounds so it's not only the the, the weather huh? but it's one of the, there's a combination of again like like i said for the for the dosage same thing but there is a change in the grape so so we need to use uh less uh uh wine ah uh, henry good question why there is no such thing you know what henry it's not illegal but there is a committee uh, that tastes uh, and assess champagne in, in its youth. And in the mind of people, red champagne does not exist. So anything too dark is usually uh, declassified. But technically, it, there's no point of not making red champagne. But then to make the red wine, you need to use your, some of your best vineyards Premier cru, grand cru, typically have lower yields, so you you kind of dedicate uh, blocks, parcels, some terroir to red wine production, and it costs more money. Production there is less less yields. Uh, it takes more. I mean the the equipment is different to make red wine. It takes more time. It's more expensive to make. <laughs> and if you would make red champagne, you would like use some of your best grapes to make this red champagne. So you would have to sell it at a crazy price to, because otherwise you could turn it into something else. So honestly, I've tried to make some in the previous world, uh, in the previous life. Um, it's interesting, but it's not the, it doesn't age very well either. So uh, it's kind of coolish, but uh, it's very geeky. And, and actually, if you do look at some of the producers that do produce a still red wine, I mean, the prices are incredible. So Bollinger does a still red wine. Uh, Henri Giraud does a still red wine. And they Aurier. Are, yeah, Aigle Aurier does. And they're super expensive. I mean, yeah. oh, if I want to drink red wine from Pinot Noir, I yeah. go to Burgundy. Yeah. No, no, we, Henry, Henry, like I've made some for like research. I've made some, don't worry. We, and I, I'm sure my friends did as well. But I think no one has been crazy enough to put it on the market yet, and it's probably a good thing yeah. for you. <laughs> and you know, there are there are places in the world that do. I'm like, look, yeah, I think like Australia. I've had sparkling shiraz. shiraz at Christmas with your Christmas pudding. Awesome, like Magella does Once a year, no more. <laughs> or with your barbecue, really lovely. Yeah, you know? yeah right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I think I think that's the thing. It's uh, it, it's, yeah, you, you can kind of see when you taste the still reds that are out there in Champagne. I just, I just don't know how excited I would be if they had bubbles. I think, I think the structure, the tannic structure is also not so friendly. So the, the, the final combination of like structure with bubbles. balance between acidity and sweetness would be tough to find. Probably not, not the best thing to make. We, there, there are more exciting things to make, Henry. Like we're doing research, you will see future projects coming out, I hope. And uh, they're way more exciting. And actually, I have a question on that. Um, and I think it's to do with sustainability and climate change. Um, so I've been talking to a lot of producers in cognac and they are experimenting with old grape varieties that used to be used in cognac in order uh, that are no longer permissible, but they are having to look at varietal. And you know, the, the problem is with grapes, a minimum three years before you can even harvest and use a grape from a vine so you know if you're looking at climate change and you're thinking it's going up one degree one degree is there things happening in champagne where people yeah, yeah they are there, there are a few things um i think one thing we can do quite quickly is to uh, uh select different massage selections or clones you know we used to uh we used to uh try to increase maturity, try to help maturity because the climate was not so friendly. Now the climate is easy. So, so we, we tossed, we, we uh, um, how do you say, we, we didn't use, we didn't regard the, 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 the clone that were slow to mature. Now it's time to go back to them. So we have, we're lucky we have a, a, like a complete collection, like a, 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 a kind of a, a collection of clones and we, we are actively digging 
into Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Meunier that, are, that take longer to ripen, you know, because it's what we need now. Yeah. We are also looking at some ancient varieties. Um, maybe, I think, Petit Melier, Arban could be interesting. Because yeah, Arban is already allowed, no? Yeah, yeah, they are, they are all allowed. Pinot Blanc, in yeah. my opinion, zero interest. Uh, Pinot Gris, we'll see. Um, other varieties, it doesn't depend on us. I think we have to look at other options uh, for the future, and this is part of the CIVC. But you also can introduce another element. And CIVC has been uh, looking at uh, varieties that are where there is a natural gene resistant to disease, mm -hmm. downy mildew, powdery mildew, meaning that those vineyards don't need any treatment. Like you don't need to use any mm -hmm. chemical, whether it's organic or not organic, because in organic, you also use chemicals. Huh? Sulfur and, and copper are not like they might be uh, in a way coming from the earth, but they're not necessarily super friendly uh, for, the, for some species anyway, for, for the grounds, for the soil. So uh, CIVC has been experimenting with one variety in particular called Fortis. Mm -hmm. And I've tasted wines made from it. And let's say next to, uh, next to schools, next to uh, uh, houses, Mm -hmm. It could be interesting to plant this variety because if you use a few percent in a blend, you won't see it. Yeah. So I think this is, you also have to take into account not only the global warming, but the environmental uh, issues for the future. And, and I think the interesting thing is that a lot of houses are doing different things. So I do, you know, a lot to one of my very, very good friends is a gentleman called Christian Holthausen, and he works for a company called Erla Noble, and they're looking at perpetual aging and reserve wines as a solution to kind of protecting that freshness. So I think a lot of people are playing with different methods. To we, we will need to uh, activate all the triggers that we can. You know, we need to play with everything we have on hand. We, a lot of it can, I think, I believe a lot in mitigating. Mm -hmm. Honestly, Champagne has been working remarkably on dropping the green gas emissions. Uh, we, we have a goal between 2003 and 25 to drop our total green gas emissions by 25%. Which is fantastic. And by 75% in 2050. And we are right on track. Wow. As a region. Because if one guy does it, it means nothing. Like we all have to be part of it. And yeah. you know, I encourage everybody, like all of us need to move, need to do things. Um, that's how it will happen. So, but we can count on the world, you know. This is, we only, small, <laughs> this is only what we can do. So a lot of it, we have, to, we have to deal with global warming anyway. And I believe more in mitigating than anything else. So mitigating, and this will take place mostly in the vineyards, mm -hmm. in the winemaking as well, but vineyards will be critical. And so, and we have rooms to improve, like vineyards higher. You know, I was in Italy on vacation. They have pergola. Why do you think they have pergola in the south of Italy? Because yeah. it's hot as hell. And, and it's cooler there than close to the ground. So I don't know if champagne one day will be grown in Pergola, but maybe, I don't know. And uh, the things you can do in the vineyard to protect the grapes with the shadow. Having shadow, uh, but, but one element is this, this, as I said before, we will have to tackle uh, um, global warming, temperature rising, that's what we think, and also environmental issues, so being in a way, going to the least possible treatments as possible. And actually, with use of, and also, you know, being friendly means, okay, people think uh, typically they react uh, quite strongly to chemical treatments, but what about saving water? Yeah. Saving water will be as critical in 10 years or 20 years than anything else now. You will see, you will see how it will be, even in the UK, we are, we are sometimes mocking you for having You're the worst great. weather and having rain every day. But believe me, in 20 years, some of your regions will be as dry as uh, south of France. Yeah, and you know, we're seeing it already. You know? Yeah, we, of course. My garden. <laughs> yeah. So water will be the new uh, blue gold, you know? It is already. And I think, you know, that's the thing. I think with winemakers, you see it more than a lot of other kind of industries, maybe potentially because you're in the land and you're in the, in, in the vineyards every day. And that's, you know, you can't make great wine with bad grapes. It's a exactly. Yeah, totally. Um, so we do have a couple of questions, which is quite exciting. Uh -huh. Can you? What was what 
temperature would you serve red champagne? If we're talking not champagne and we're talking uh, Australian sparkling Shiraz, as cold as possible. But the next question, probably a bit more, a bit more relevant. Uh, what temperature should we be serving our champagne? I think that's a really nice question um, and one that's quite well, interesting. I, I, it's, it's such a, it's not an easy way to answer. Uh, it depends. You know, now where I am, it's 35 degrees, 34 degrees. It's hot as hell. And I have them on ice here. And I try to keep them at like six, seven degrees because in the glass, the temperature is raising like crazy. So it depends where you are. It depends if it's summer, if it's winter. I think more important is what the temperature you want in your glass. Uh, I, I like to have my non-vintage at, let's say, 9, 10 degrees Celsius, meaning temperature of serving would, would be 7 to 8 mm -hmm. degrees Celsius. For vintage, raise this by 1, 2, 1 or 2 degrees. So like serve at 9, 10 to reach 11, 10, 11 or 11, 12. And, and I opened mine earlier and, you know, I did it deliberately because I had it in a very cold fridge. And for me, actually, it was too cold. So, you know, just think about kind of what it's temperature changes as, as no, the one. one thing important. It's easier to let it warm up than cool down. Unless you live in Alaska or in uh, Rovaniemi in Finland uh, in winter, the temperature in the glass won't drop. So better to serve it sometime a little bit too cold let it warm up because this will happen. And actually that, that um, Evan, I think, you know, that answers your question. Yeah, you, you know, it's better if you get it, it's cold first and then you warm it up because- Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's hard to, to not drink, to, to leave champagne to warm up because you want to drink it, but you know, you can, you can sip it slowly and, and keep it outside and, you know, temperatures go up pretty quick. And um, one of the most memorable meals I ever had in my life actually it was with Don Perignon and they did for every oh yeah the temperature I, went up, they served a different course and I have to say it's probably one of the most mind-blowing things yeah. I, I'm not surprised it's a very cool experience to do ever done and, you know, and it's hard to do with any other wine than champagne yeah well no it'd be different it'd be very different I think I think champagne stands like I don't know I think that they a 12 16 if I remember something like this yeah. Yes. And, and, and it would be hard. I mean, 60 is a bit extreme, but it still works. But it would be hard to do this experience. Maybe white wine would work as well. I, I think white wine, red, maybe if you yeah. have burgundy. You can't just yeah, yeah, yeah. Eight degrees for red is a bit too cold. Uh, yeah. There was another question of how can you keep, how long can you keep a bottle? Uh, I think Henry asked that earlier, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, Henry, I think Henry raised that question. Uh, it depends how much volume there is left in the bottle. My, my experience, if you have less than a third, it won't keep long. Just drink it. <laughs> probably, probably barely overnight, because it means, you know, once you close it with this, in the early age, uh, the gas, which is still dissolved, will uh, go into the gaseous form to balance the pressure. So the less Bottle, the less wine there is left, the more gas will escape from it. So the flatter it will become. Mm -hmm. So in a way, this works, in my opinion, if you have half of the bottle or more. Less than that, third, drink it. And, if and the third on a, and, a, and a half, then it's... But then the solution is half bottles. If you're not sure you're going to drink uh, the full bottle because you're on your own and sick, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> but, and I think as, I, as I say, if there are four of you, you open a champagne bottle. I mean, like if you have you know three friends and yourself, you open a champagne bottle and there is some left. There's something wrong. Yeah, Either the champagne or your friends. Definitely your friends. <laughs> Um, do we ever use a perlage system to score? Well, perlage is a, is, a, is a psychological trick. Thank you. It gives the impression that there is pressure, but you don't build pressure back. So it's, it makes a nice pop, but that's about it. And also the other sorry, thing is... Sorry to kill a myth, but yeah. it's, it's, 
it's, it's, if you look at physics, it, it cannot work. There's, there, the system is not just pressurized enough to, to do anything in terms of like compensating for the loss of carbon gas. So it'll create a sense of something, but also it's almost like pumping yeah. flat. You're just yeah. But that's, that's good. That's, it's, it's important. When you open it and there's pop, you think there's gas and mentally you are uh, in a better mood. But also don't put the spoon in the bottle of champagne because that's a bit of a myth as well. That's also no one. Have you never seen that one that people want to put a spoon in the bottle? Because oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I work on that technique. It doesn't work. Yeah, no. Just, just drink it. Makes no difference. Um, and actually, we have to wish Catherine a happy birthday, who is not watching right now, but she is watching later. It's her, it's a very special birthday. I won't say it because she's a lady, um, but it's a fantastic birthday. I have passed the age that she is turning and I can tell you it only gets better. Um, but yeah, Catherine, happy birthday for later. Um, does anyone, before we kind of sort of wrap up, anyone have any other questions? I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about glasses, we've talked about serving champagne, we've talked about sort of, because I know there's a lot of people sometimes have questions. One thing, do not, when your friend gives you a bottle of champagne, do not leave it a pride of place, even if it's very pretty, on your mantelpiece above the fire, four months on end, it will not taste good. Trust me. Don't, 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 Hello. don't for a special occasion on the mantelpiece. No, you know what? We don't wait for a special occasion. We like yeah. to say champagne makes the occasion special. Absolutely. Ooh. Okay, Alistair, two questions. Uh, no, Alistair, any plans for a half liter bottle size? No, no plan. It's uh, too much work and it's not allowed in the European community. And, and uh, more to me... Sal, the largest bottle of Brunet that has been sabotaged. Do you mean sabraged? So with the... Sabraged or sabotaged? Sabotage. I'm trying to avoid that thing. <laughs> Maybe sabrage. Sabrage. Yes. I have no. I have. I have no. Uh, sab. Uh, I don't know. We used to make a uh, by transfer back in the days. Uh, Nabucodonosor, so the largest format. I'm sure there was one crazy guy or lady who <laughs> sabraged this, but I know when and where. I would guess in the UK for some reason. There are some really brutal videos on Facebook if you ever want to watch or on YouTube. I tell you what, this bottle is not saber friendly. No. The shape of it doesn't work very well. Uh, the sabrage? I, I, I got in, in trouble in Russia one day doing it. They pushed me to do it. They said no. I said no. They pushed me in the Russians. You, after some time, you said yes. <laughs> and the bottle exploded in my hand. So. Uh, yeah. I don't do it anymore. And, and you need a really, a, a, the more sort of traditional style bottle and you need to run it up the seam. And you have go, to be... go without, you can do it. The bottle is a bit friendlier, but on non-vintage, nah. <laughs> I still have the empty bottle you gave me at the Ritz. Oh, Martin. Martin. All right. We like Martin. That's very I'm cool. I'm so glad that you're not complaining that I didn't give you a full bottle though, but that's okay. But this was at the very special Don Renard dinner, I think. Was that it, Martin? Was it a Don Renard dinner? Because uh, in Don Renard, I mean, we haven't talked much about I miss, it. I miss those uh, dinner at the Ritz. They were so amazing. Ah, yes. Martin, it was. What was that? 1990 vintage? Three Which, liter. Oh, yeah, we had the Jeroboam of Blanc de Blanc. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Really? That's I, the way to go. That is definitely the way to go. And, uh, Look, is there any more questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll wrap up. But you know, oh, excellent dinner, absolutely. It's uh, being hungry, by the way. So. I know I'm starving. I was just like, oh, <laughs> Frederick, it is as always an absolute pleasure. I mean, I, I always say when anyone says to me, who's sort of one of the, your kind of heroes in the champagne world? And it's very much you. I, I, you won't remember this, but I met you over 20 years ago when you first started at Brunard. And I was probably like just starting in the, in the wine industry. And I still to this day remember that visit. And you know, Brunard has always been a, a, a champagne house that has had a huge place in my heart. And it's been an absolute honor to talk to you tonight. Thank you so, so much. And we look forward to raising a glass together in person at some point.
tell you when you can when you can resume uh, traveling more easily but i know we have uh, we've had a few uh, people from uk coming you know come to see us we'll be happy to sh show you our sellers what we do in terms of sustainability and and, and uh, are amazing i mean and of course taste we now in a normal size bottle not half bottles <laughs> and discover the vintages the dawn in our particularly absolutely and then they're stunning guys cheers salut everyone thank, thank you so much it was such a pleasure